Here we've got a 2ZR FXC from a Toyota Prius and this engine is completely locked up. And rightfully so, you can see there's a piece of connecting rod sticking outside the block on this side. And on this side there's a little pinhole that's leaking oil. We've got all the bell housing bolts out of here but in order to disconnect this from the clutch, I might have to disassemble the bottom half of this engine. Now in order to remove the upper oil pan, you gotta remove the timing cover but before you do that, I gotta remove the valve cover. So I might as well just do this tear down off the stand and on the ground with the transmission still attached. All right, quick tour of this engine. We've got a plastic intake manifold, variable valve timing only on the intake side with a metal valve cover, coil on plug, and then we've got a steel exhaust manifold that feeds an EGR system at the back here. And then at the front, a very simple timing chain cover and then a water pump that's electric. There's also a plastic canister housing for the oil filter, which I don't like because sometimes they break and leak. I'm gonna start this tear down by removing the exhaust manifold. Oh, look at that, it just fell off. Now I'm gonna see how much of the wiring harness I can save. Finally, I got all that harness off of there. Now because this is one of those efficient engines that uses EGR, basically it takes the exhaust gases and sends it back into the intake to get reburned. So the next thing I'm gonna do is let's get rid of that. Now having a clogged EGR is actually very common on these engines, so you'd have to clean this thing out. Now this engine does use port injection. You can see this is the fuel rail here, but just below that, I'm gonna remove the intake. Let's see if this will come off. Just have two PCV lines underneath here to remove. And there's the intake with the throttle body at the bottom here. Now I'm going to remove the fuel rail next. And now I can pop that off. It comes off with a piece of the fuel line. And you'll see the four injectors here. All right, so with the intake and exhaust off, the next thing I'm going to do is remove this valve cover. This engine's a bit old school. It uses variable valve timing only on the intake side. There's a solenoid for it. Actually goes through the valve cover. And here you can see the oil tube to lubricate all of these camshafts. This engine actually looks pretty clean inside. Taking a look under the hood of this 304,000 kilometer Toyota Prius 2ZR engine, you can see things are actually pretty clean under here. Seems like it's had its regular oil change, which I didn't expect given the condition of the rest of this vehicle, which was pretty rough. Now the valve train is a very simple cam over roller arm design here, which is then going to push down on the valve spring directly. It's a very simple setup, not like any VTEC setup where you've got rocker arms that change lift and it's a bit old school that you got VVT on the intake side you got the space for it on the passenger side but they just didn't put it in here next I'm going to focus on removing this front cover I'm going to first remove this 19 crank bolt oil coming out of that that's weird there's your harmonic balancer now the water pump on this hybrid version of the engine has to be electric because it has to circulate heat through the heater core when the engine is in hybrid mode so I'm next going to remove this this is also a failure point in some of these just one plug and a plastic impeller, which I don't like. Now on the back side of that water pump is where the thermostat housing would be. And getting these bolts out, especially this one here, is really tricky, especially when the intake's covering it. And you can't really see what you're doing if you have to change the thermostat on your car. I'm going to remove the engine mount neck. What the heck? I don't usually bolt them in from underneath. This is a stupid design, but that stud in the way. Can't get my socket on there. So I gotta remove the stud. All right, next up, I'm going to remove the 14s, the 12s, and the 10. I go onto this timing cover. And this here is the oil filter housing. This is a cartridge style oil filter and it's got a plastic housing on it. Now most people will tend to upgrade this to the metal version found in the older model. Now the tensioner is actually located on the timing cover. So I'm going to remove these two nuts. Knock this plate free here. Ooh, and out came the tensioner in full tension. That was a bit tricky. Now I'm going to pry the timing cover off. If I forgot any bolts anywhere. Crank bolt out of the way. Here's the inside of the timing cover. You can see the tensioner just sat in this cavity over here. There is a galley that goes to the oil pressure sender over here, and it comes up to these two holes. Taking a look under the timing cover, it's a very simple and straightforward engine. Here you have the crankshaft. It's gonna power a timing chain to the two chains. That's it, with one tensioner. Now these guides are made of plastic, and they, while they do feel rigid, I can definitely see these chipping off after a little while. At the bottom here, we do have a plastic guide that goes down to the oil. So. Whoa, that jumped pretty violently at me. Let's take this guy off here. Now this guide is actually backed with metal and it's got a plastic slide on it, which is better than this one at least. Here. 
And then we've got another slide here, another plastic slide with a metal backing, that's good. And then we can pop this chain off. Chain feels reasonable for a four cylinder engine. You can pop off this gear at the bottom here. And then at the bottom, I'm just gonna remove this. This is actually a tensioner, it's got a spring in it. Timing gear on here, which is what triggers the crankshaft position sensor. I'm gonna loosen off these 14s for the camshaft. Now in these Toyotas, they use a cam cradle, which is essentially the camshaft's position in this H ladder shape thing here. And that kind of keeps everything together as opposed to using separate cam caps. Now if I remove all of the 12 millimeter bolts, I should be able to take this entire cradle off to get access to the head. And now this whole assembly can be removed, which is nice and easy. Here you can see the little roller arms. They have these little hydraulic lifters inside of here that are activated by the oil flowing in here to push up against the camshaft so there's no clearance between the two. You got to make sure you use the right head bolt tool. This is a 10 millimeter bi-hexagon head, which means that the angles here are different than just a triple square. You can also get away with using a regular hex, but I've done that and I've stripped a head bolt before. It's mostly Toyota and Lexus that uses this anyways. Specific to the 2ZR FXE hybrid version of this engine, the head gasket is one of the biggest failure points on these engines. A lot of people do end up replacing this because the rest of the vehicle does actually last pretty long, but it's kind of sad that you got to do so much labor just to get down here and replace this gasket. That's exaggerated by the fact that you've got an electric water pump that drives this thing in hybrid mode, and you've got heat cycling that's going back and forth, heating and cooling this block, which is not good for this head gasket. It's so crusty. Now this engine's got bigger issues than that. Usually the two opposing cylinders on the outside here are in sync with each other, which they are, but the two middle ones here are not. You can see that one's plunged all the way down there, and you can see that there's definitely damage where the piston hit the valve, and it grazed out a little piece of carbon there. And that, not surprisingly, is the one that's got this little hole in the side of the block over here. So I've got my daughter's baby dress here. I'm just gonna use that to sap up some of this oil was not prepared for that because it did drain this engine. Look at this tiny little oil pan, slightly bigger than my palm. I'm gonna go ahead and remove it. Whoa, we got the glitter. I was expecting more parts in there, but that's a lot of glitter. Pretty sure this is bearing material. It's all sludgy too. I don't see anything immediate in the pickup tube. Let's remove this oil pump next. You can see this here is where the chain would drive it. Oh yeah, there's definitely stuff inside of there. Chunks of metal. Now holding the upper oil pan to the block is a bunch of 12 millimeter bolts. Got my little apprentice helping me out here. Now there's a piece of the connecting rod sticking out here. So I'm gonna be fighting against that as well as the dowels on the bell housing. I've already got all the bell housing bolts out. So we're just gonna keep whacking this until something happens. It's already damaged already, so can't do any worse. Alrighty, oh, there's parts coming out. Oh, you got this piece, which looks like a bearing. It's all heated up and mashed up. And then we got this piece, which looks like the connecting rod cap, but it's all mashed up and heated up and melted. That's crazy. Oh yeah, and this is the piece of connecting rod that's causing this thing to seize up. I don't know how I'm gonna get that out of there. I'm gonna have to disconnect the crankshaft. But the crankshaft is not really bolted to this transmission, is it? I'm just gonna see if I can hammer it to get it to turn. This thing's not moving at all. All right, so I'm able to get this thing to separate slightly. Let's see if we can pull it off with the flywheel in there. Finally, I got it. Okay, here you can see the connecting rod that's damaged up. I'm gonna remove the other three connecting rods that are remaining. They're a 10 millimeter 12 point socket. This bearing is okay. Bearing is okay. This one's fine. Now I'm going to remove the main bearing caps. The bearing's okay. Yeah, this one's really bad too. So on the crankshaft, we have a permanently applied clutch, which is what they use in hybrids. There's no torque converter. I'm gonna remove this plate here. There you go. This is more like a damper. And here we have the crankshaft bolts. All right, I'm gonna remove this. It's a 14 actually. And here's the flywheel. It's got a bit of heft to it. All right, the next challenge is to get this crankshaft out of here with the connecting rod. Okay, here's the crankshaft. Look at that connecting rod. That's crazy. Look, 
Here we've got the engine all taken apart. Let's take a closer look at some of the carnage. And we're going to start here at the bottom where we have the lower oil pan. Of course we have all of this gooey paste here which has a lot of fresh metal shavings inside here which is likely bearing material. And of course we've got the shrapnel which is left here which is the connecting rod cap. Now this is supposed to look like this. And this bearing over here, which is all flattened and overheated and rolled over on itself, is supposed to look like this bearing inside of here. Now surprisingly, the other connecting rod bearings actually look pretty good. It's really the main bearings that took the hit. The upper oil pan is equally as roasted. It's got a big chunk where the connecting rod was sticking out and the boss here for the bolt is broken. Now the oil pump, which sits inside of here, bolts directly to this upper oil pan and its passages are going to take oil directly to the oil filter located on the block above. Now just for fun let's take apart this oil pump to see if there's any damage in here. This is more of a wheel style pump as opposed to a vein pump. I'll just take out this wheel over here with the star gear. I don't see any carnage on there. I don't see severe wear on here either. Let's use my brother's armless here to clean things up. Doesn't need that. He doesn't wear shirts anyways. Yeah, besides the machining mark, I don't see any debris that was run through here. Now taking a look at the bottom of the block, it's obvious that cylinder number three was the one that failed. It's got all the shrapnel and damage marks around it, but surprisingly the other three cylinders look okay. There wasn't really anything carried forth through the other ones. So there used to be a cylinder liner sprayer over here but it's currently on sick leave. Now in terms of the oil it's going to flow down for the block over here and then exit out to the front where we have the timing cover. Now that's because the timing cover is actually what... Shoot I broke my toothbrush in there. Oh my toothbrush is stuck. That's because the timing cover is actually what holds the oil filter. Now, I don't like that because you got a rubber o-ring here that could fail. It's just an additional interface as opposed to mounting the filter right on the block. Now oil from the pump is going to flow up into this apple oil pan and then into this hole and then back out through this hole. Now the timing cover is what mounts up to here and that's got the oil filter on it. So filter oil is then going to make its way over through here and then back up into the block. Now filtered oil is then going to come through the block over here and then it's going to be cross machined over here as you can see down to the oil galley that runs the length of the block. Now that oil galley runs the length of the block and it's going to power the cylinder sprayers but you can see that the main bearings are also tapped off of it. Now this is where I think things got a little critical on this engine. Now this crankshaft's nothing special. This is a normal four cylinder forged crankshaft. Feels pretty beefy unlike some Hyundai and Kia engines of this size. Now what's interesting here is the actual failure mode. You see the main bearings especially the ones at the back here really took a lot of damage and that's probably because of oil starvation and overheating. Usually the connecting rod bearings are what star first because the oil has to go to the main bearings and then through the crankshaft to the connecting rod bearing. Now obviously this connecting rod and this piston did in fact fail first and that's because of a lack of lubrication. This guy starts to heat up. The bearings start to spin, it has nowhere to go, it just seizes up. Now because likely this engine was spinning at a very high RPM due to the amount of damage I see here, the connecting rod has nowhere to go and decides to exit the block which is where we got the damage. Now if you had just seen a bent connecting rod without these lubrication issues then you would suspect hydro locking that maybe the driver went through some water and then the piston would have nothing to compress because liquid is not compressible and instead the connecting rod itself would compress as you see here. Now speaking of these pistons they all have a similar amount of carbon none of them were suspected of steam cleaning which means that this engine wasn't burning any coolant. These hybrid versions of the engine are very notorious for blowing head gaskets and then coolant mixes with oil or it goes in the combustion chamber and starts to steam clean things. Now I tore down one of these engines before if you want to check that out in more detail but I'm not a fan of these low tension oil rings which is this oil ring at the bottom. You can see there's not much room for oil to escape when it's sliding down the cylinder wall and go back down the inside of the piston and instead it just ends up escaping on the top of the piston and you end up burning oil. It still is pretty impressive that you can wrap a connecting rod around the crankshaft. We also took out a chunk of this piston over here but most notably from the boroscope I was able to directly see that there was piston to valve damage as we're going to see next. So we've got a look under the cylinder head particularly number three here where you can see this valve is bent and it's stuck open. There's no camshafts on it which means that it should be sealed like these other ones over here. I was able to see with the boroscope that this guy is actually stuck open here and that's not a good sign and that means that it obviously won't hold compression. Now also if you see all this white crust over here I have a sl slight suspicion that the previous owner used a little bit of stop leak because maybe the head gasket was starting to go. Now if you use too much stop leak you can actually cause a heart attack in the engine where you got a blockage and then the car starts to overheat. If you check out my Subaru H6 video that was actually the cause of engine failure not the head gas. Across the top here once again a fairly simple Toyota head where you have the cam as part of a separate piece and then we've got the actual head itself which has these hydraulic lifters inside. Now these lifters sit inside here and they have an oil galley that runs along here and the oil pressure is going to push up on it 
so that way you don't have any lash between the roller and the valve. So here we come to the timing cover, which in my view is a very weak point in this design. Ideally, you want to get rid of as many failure modes as possible. And what Toyota's done here is they've run the oil from the block through this hole here, through the timing cover, and then back up to the head. This is basically the oil supply line for the variable valve timing, lubrication for the camshafts, as well as the lifters. Now all the oil has to run through these two interfaces over here, and of course that opens up the potential for leak. In addition to the gasket behind this galley over here, all of that could lower the oil pressure going to the head and of course starve it. Interesting to note, the tensioner does not have an oil galley running to it, it's just barely spring-loaded. In addition, on the front here, we have the oil filter housing and the filter itself. This is made of plastic, which I don't like because it could eventually crack with heat and wear and it's going to leak. And also you've got two extra interfaces over here on the back and on the front here where oil could also leak and you lose oil pressure. Now the hybrid version of this engine uses a plastic water pump with a plastic impeller. The back of it is just a giant heat sink and that mounts up to the timing cover itself rather than the block. Now on the back of it there's also a plastic thermostat housing. I don't really like the direction Toyota went with this generation of hybrid. By the way these are a weak spot on these cars and they're fairly expensive to replace. Even aftermarket ones are like two three hundred dollars. There's nothing really interesting with the air intake. It's a giant piece of plastic. You got a vacuum switching valve here and of course the EGR pipe is going to pump in all that carbon to the intake and of course we've got a drive-by throttle butt. Hey BMW take note this engine actually has an oil dipstick. Yeah I know it's a Prius and all. Now here we've got the valve cover. It's great it's made of metal but we have yet another interface over here with a gasket that could leak because that feeds the oil control valve at the top. And that's a wrap on the 2ZR FXE engine from Toyota. This fits the Prius and the Lexus CT200. Now if you do have one of those cars make sure you check the oil often if you don't want this happening to you and also check the coolant because that was also a big issue on those cars. A lot of people end up swapping Gen 4 engines from 2016 and up because of the flaws of this engine. Make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one. And also stay tuned for the hybrid system video where we tear down this transmission.